Thank you very much, Sandeep, and all of you for choosing to spend your morning here um, talking about cancer. I am a basic scientist, so I'll be addressing some basic issues. And if you all come on a short, short journey with me, we'll talk about some basic biology and how cancer actually works. Um, so the title of my talk is, How Does Cancer Avoid the Immune System? And what, what can we do about it? But I'm basically going to tell you what I know about cancer uh, for the layperson. So cancer is a problem. As anyone reading this, uh, this slide can tell, there's, um, it affects and effectively ends the lives of too many people too often. And uh, we have to be able to do something about this. There is not one person in this room whose life is not directly affected either themselves or by someone that they know or in their family by cancer. And it's the goal of um, many clinical researchers and myself included to try and do something about this. And that's through research and understanding. Because the word cancer strikes dread and misunderstanding and fear into people's hearts because it's threatening and it's unknown. And those two things together for a human being can um, lead to confusion and um, hopelessness. I'm here to tell you that the hopelessness uh, is something that we don't need to um, focus on anymore. We're in a new era, and it's not the tired metaphor of we're at the threshold of a, of a new era. We are through the doorway, and we have an, an amazing armamentarium of therapies to bring toward cancer. The one I'm going to talk about today that is the subject of, of this uh, morning is immunotherapy, and it's entirely new. And we'll uh, start slow and then build up to Ezra Cohen's talk that talks about really the sharp end of the stick and what's going on in the clinic. What I'm here to tell you is that we are not guessing. We understand, based on decades of research, the biology of cancer, the, how the immune system works, how the immune system recognizes cancer, and what to do about it. We know the formulations. We know the tools we have to use to apply this to the control of, of cancer. And we found out that it's working. We are, um, we are actually seeing frank cures in cancers that five, ten years ago were intractable. Important to know what is cancer beyond something that strikes fear and um, conjures up the idea of um, an inexorable death with pain and chemotherapy and, um, and hopelessness. Cancer is a progressive disease in which cells that are supposed to behave and grow only when they're told to fail to do that. And for the metaphor of um, a car that was brought up earlier is an apt one. All of you living in San Diego have been in traffic on the 5 north or south at any given um, afternoon at 5 p.m. Everybody is moving ahead and doing what they should be doing and sort of cooperating. If there was a car that had a, um, somebody mashed down the gas pedal, it's going to break through where it should be and hit some other um, person's car. Imagine that car could divide you would have essentially a tumor, um, a mass of, of cells that starts in a single cell, but then grows. And the car going forward is growing uncontrollably. And that's because either someone's pressing down the gas pedal or the brake has been um, torn out. So tumors grow uncontrollably to break through the, uh, where they originally arose. Car metaphor breaks down here, but these cancer cells can actually spread and move through, through in, uh, throughout your body and set up residence and begin to grow elsewhere. And this is really the source of the greatest mortality in cancer is the uh, metastasis. If there's a primary tumor, surgeons can get to that. But once it moves, then it's, um, it's much more, more difficult. After all that uh, negative, I'd like to show you a, a happy baby. So this is meant to illustrate that we are a mass of cells. There are 37 trillion cells, a very large number, um, that comprise the human body. There's very different kinds of, of cells that each should cooperate and work with each other to achieve their specialized function for the organ where they're at. This is not how I look at, um, actually, a human body. This is more closer. And it's very complex. There's a myriad of different cell types because there's many different organ systems. And it's really a miracle of complexity and cooperation that we are actually alive, that all these things function, divide when they should, leave when they should, differentiate when they should, and it, it, wor it works wonderfully. The way this works, actually, is at the level of each individual single cell will um, have um, signals that are hardwired 
in its DNA. This is the nucleus of the cell and the, the DNA, the instructions that are there. And then this is the plasma membrane. This is the, uh, the, the end of the, the cell, and this is the extracellular um, environment. The growth and death of a cell, its, its proliferation and survival is regulated by intrinsic signals in the DNA and extrinsic um, signals from the outside world. For this to work, it requires communication. It requires signals from the outside to be received by a receptor. Let's say this is a growth factor. This should only be there when the cell is supposed to grow and that message is transmitted and the DNA says, okay, grow, we're gonna copy ourselves. DNA replication is crucial to the integrity of a cell. This is an animation of what we um, know now about the model of how DNA is uh, replicated. So this is the DNA strand here that's being copied and there's copy one and copy two. And so the, the fidelity of this is critical. There are three billion letters, um, A, C, G, T are the, the four types. There's three billion base pairs. And every time a cell divides, you've got to copy all three billion of those properly. If not, you'll, then you'll have um, mutations. When it works, it's amazing. These are epithelial cells that are dividing. You can see the chromosomes in red, and they get pulled to each end of the uh, cell. And everything uh, works wonderfully when there is cooperation and uh, synchrony. Mistakes do happen, though. There's an innate error rate in copying DNA. It's a, it's a very small number, but if you have 50 to 70 billion of your cells dividing every day, you're gonna make mistakes in about 30 of them every day. Now, most of these mistakes don't matter. There are only 2% of the DNA codes for proteins. But should these mistakes happen in a protein that is the gas pedal or the brake, this is when cancer can begin to, to um, happen. Now, the DNA is the, the blueprint in the head office. There's something called RNA that is the instructions that go out to the shop floor to make a protein. If there's a mistake in the DNA, then there's gonna be a mistake in those instructions going out to the shop floor called RNA, and it's the RNA that actually makes the protein, the things that do the, the work in the cell. So mutations in the DNA, just occurring uh, naturally, will lead to mutations in the protein. And this is a cancer cell, and it is not normal looking, it is not normal functioning, and it is so because of function altering mutations in the proteins that control the life and death of that cell, the gas pedal and the brake, if you will. It doesn't happen all at once, it's not one mutation and then you've got a cancer cell. These things happen progressively and you have one mutation that will confer a certain uh, feature like the cell grows when it, without needing uh, to be told so, a second mutation can stop it from dying. A third mutation can make it spread. And so what I say at the top is evolution is um, the survival of the fittest. It's an organism trying to adapt to a changing environment. Think about the cancer cell as an organism within, within the um, patient. It's just trying to get along and it's going to roll the dice and have random mutations. The mutations that confer the ability to grow and survive and spread are gonna be selected for, just like evolution works. And so cancer recapitulates evolution within the individual patient. And this is, again, why it's so disturbing. This is like a betrayal from within. You can see it happen stepwise. You can identify the mutations. We have that um, ability now. And that leads to a new way of treating cancer. Um, we've so far been um, cutting it out, burning it out, or poisoning it out with impressive levels of success. But immunotherapy is different because the drug, as Dr. Patel said, is your own T cells, your own immune system. So this is a bit complex. I'm not trying to do immunology 101, but you basically have two components of your immune system. You have one that has been preserved from worms to human beings, and that it works uh, is always on, it works very quickly, it is limited in its effect, but it recognizes features of invasive pathogens because our immune system is not here necessarily to pick up on cancer and kill it or to stymie transplant surgeons. The immune system exists because we live in a very dirty world of 
molds and fungi and bacteria and viruses. We, in fact, as an organism, are probably 90% by cell number bacteria living in our GI tract. But it's a happy symbiosis. There's an armed detente going on. When you get a pathogenic infection, that causes damage and it's non-self. And those two things together are what the immune system responds to. The innate immune system recognizes features of all bacteria, all viruses, and it recognizes when our tissues have been damaged. The other part of the immune system, the one that we're talking about with T cells, is the adaptive immune system. And that arm takes the time to recognize this bacteria from that bacteria, or this virus from uh, that virus. When we get childhood vaccines, we're essentially arming the adaptive arm of the immune system to produce B cells or T cells that recognize that varicella uh, zoster or that measles virus. And they expand, and most of, of the cells that expand die, but you have lifelong memory that will be called up next time you get um, exposed to that, that uh, virus. So the, the T cells are part of that slower moving but ultimately more effective adaptive arm of the um, immune system. And what T cells see are things that would be specific, as I said, to this virus or that virus. They see little pieces of proteins expressed by this or that the virus. And I'm not trying to go through how complex it is, but basically this is what T cells see. And this whole system is um, put into beautiful work when you get exposed to, let's say, in um, flu, your innate system will sense, ah, this is a virus. It'll go to work and turn on things. The adaptive immune system works by uh, cells that are kind of like Pac-Man, that old Pac-Man game where the thing runs around picking up um, dots. We have cells within us that run around and, and pick up pieces of what that they can find, show them to the T cells, and then the T cell response will um, ensue. So as the immune response against the pathogenic infection um, uh, progresses, at the end of the day, you have T cells that will recognize that, in this case, flu, and kill infected cells because those cells have pieces of that virus at the surface. And the same is true for cancer, is what we were finding. If you have a, a, a cancer down here at the, the bottom of the figure, the Pac-Man cells will come and grab pieces of those cancers, move to the lymph nodes, show the pieces to T cells, and those T cells that recognize the differences on the cancer cells will expand and hopefully go in and kill the, the um, tumor. And this is the cancer immunity um, cycle. And it's the same component as the, the um, antiviral or antibacterial response. Now, the way that the, the T cells kill, the T cell is in red here, the cancer cell is in blue, is they go right up to that cell, they recognize it, they punch a hole in it, and they put in toxic proteins. The toxic proteins are stained red here, the, can the cancer cell is in blue, the T cell is in green, and they secrete right there to the interface. And these red toxic proteins enter the cancer cell and basically convince it to commit suicide. The T cell is the bad psychiatrist of the immune system. It only happens at the interface of the T cell and the tumor cell, and that's important to not cause damage to normal cells that are, are not in, in, in the area. So once these toxic proteins go in, that's it for that target cell. It commits suicide, and that T cell is still hungry, and it can go on to kill other cells. It's been shown experimentally that one T cell can easily kill a thousand target cells. So T cells are good, and this all works when it works. The tumor, of course, is not um, complicit in its own death. The tumor cell is doing what it can using normal physiologic uh, mechanisms to stop that um, immune response. Um, what we see on a gross level as a tumor there's actually a lot of different cells. There's the transformed cells, the one that won't stop growing and won't die, but there's other cells of the, um, of the body that are part of that tumor. We talked about the innate immune system and the thing that recognizes features of this bacteria or that virus. Tumors don't have that. Tumors do a fairly poor job of simulating a viral infection. What a tumor is more often perceived at is, is a wound that won't heal. And so the immune system doesn't get properly activated the way that it should in the cases of a, a tumor that is growing. There are T cells that recognize the neoantigens that are the mutations that are only in the um, tumor. But this business of evolution, of 
evolution continues. And if a tumor, um, a subclone, one cell among many, develops the ability to put out an immunosuppressive substance or lose expression of that antigen, anything that can help it avoid the immune response, that will be selected for. And so you have the selection and um, evolution of the cancer cell. It's a wily beast that's changing its spots, and that happens with, with um, time. There's a, a metaphor that I use from Alice in Wonderland, the uh, Red Queen that always outpaced Alice's ability to uh, reach her. This is what's going on in the, the cancer cell. There are ways around this, and we'll, we'll get to that. Once again, the cells of the local um, microenvironment, that area right around the um, tumor cell, are trying, um, using normal physiological mechanisms to shut down the um, immune response. And I'm listing just um, a few cells in different colors. There, there won't be a test at, at the end of this. But there are immunosuppressive substances that are being produced by the cells in the environment of the tumor that are part of it, including PDL1, which Dr. Patel mentioned, that are there to shut things down. Now, once we know these and we identify them, we can develop our reagents to overcome them. And that's what part of immunotherapy is, um, as it is now. So um, Dr. Cohen is going to speak about immunotherapy in general. My message is, what can we do about it? That was there in my title. Well, you can know your enemy. This is absolutely a battle. And we don't want to bring a gun to a knife fight. We want to bring a million of our friends with um, guns and, and uh, nuclear weapons. So um, you can take the brakes off the immune system. You can send in hardwired cells that recognize the um, tumor. The work that I'm engaged in is actually involving sequencing the entire genome of cancer cell and the normal cells from that same patient and identifying all of the somatic mutations, all of the mutations that are specific to the cancer cell, and then in a further step, identifying which of those are recognized by a patient's own immune system. So if there's a patient, what we do in my lab is find out what was your immune response to your cancer. Very complex, very exciting, but it's really cutting to the heart of the matter because we're in the area of personalized medicine. It's not a one-size-fits-all. It's not one drug for everybody but it's taking the time um, to learn exactly what a person's cancer is about, what are the mechanisms that their tumor is throwing up to prevent the immune response, and what are the targets that we can go for and have a more successful therapy. So I seem to have talked way too fast. I'm, uh, you're just going to be some extra time here. My last slide, my last message is that this really does work. We are not, as I said, at the threshold. We are through the doorway and looking at, the, at all of the, the tools we have and trying to divinate which ones are the best ones. And it's going to be particular patients, not groups of, of patients. I, I think they're going to work here. This is what we call a Kaplan-Meier plot for doctors Kaplan and Meyer. We're looking at survival on this axis and time over here. Standard therapy in general and not um, overall moves the curve to the right. It takes longer for people to succumb but um, many of them do. What we're seeing with immunotherapy is tails. That is, when it works, it works, and that you get a cure. And we often joke that we want our patients to die of something else, not the disease for which they've been sent um, to us. Now, of course, this is not 100%, and there is room for improvement. And the room for improvement um, is going to involve research. Oh, well, that didn't transfer so well. Resources, research, and the results. And um, discovery, but strategic discovery. As I said at the outset of the talk, we know what the players are, we know how they work, and we simply need to know each individual cancer and, and its idiosyncratic um, mechanisms, and then we can really move this ahead much, much faster. So I am part of something much bigger than myself which is a good thing, and that is the Center for Cancer Immunotherapy. The next speaker, Ezra Cohen, is the clinical director. Um, I'm the translational science director, and um, it takes a lot of people, uh, bioinformatics people and, and um, immunotherapists, um, medical oncologists, pathologists, and it's amazing to do team science. And um, everybody here, because you're here, you're part of the team now. And I hope I've been able to explain something about the basic biology of cancer and how immunotherapy works. In the next talk, we'll hear more from 
Dr. Cohen on what's going on in the, the uh, trenches. But uh, I thank you for your time and attention.